All right, we're going to call the meeting to order. First uh, item on the EHS agenda for May 8th is to discuss and vote to approve the conclusion to the open meeting law complaint submitted by Ann Fenner Finema regarding EHS meeting 211, failing to include sufficient detail in the notice and minutes, and to accept revised minutes as amended 5112. So moved. Second. Any discussion? So we had a discussion uh, we received from the Attorney General's office that uh, the meeting that was reviewed which would be the date of the meeting in August. August, August 2nd of uh, mm -hmm. okay, 2011. Uh, in, in essence, the uh, findings came off that we had to uh, improve the description provided in the minutes. So after this material came in, I took the liberty of talking to uh, Evelyn, asked her to review the material, uh, review any material that she may have had, and to update the minutes to be more reflective of uh, the information that uh, um, the Attorney General's Office was looking for. So this evening we provided to you uh, an amended May 1st, 2012 minutes from the Tuesday, August 2nd, in compliance with the request on the um, post of the Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's important to note that the Attorney General did find that there was an open meeting law violation for failing to include sufficient detail in the notice for its August 2nd, 2011 meeting and the minutes of that same meeting, and that there was none against the town manager because he was not a member of the deliberative body. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anybody else want to read it? It might be, um, obviously the full document is on file for those who choose to read it. Um, you might notice, note that other um, complaints that were noted at that time were not found to be in violation, so, um, and we had addressed having much better minutes in the past, so they asked us to just to revise the minutes, and uh, I believe that's what we want. Any other? Um, okay, seeing so I'm all in favor of the revised minutes as proposed. Moving on to agenda item number two update on the reorganization of cable operations. Yeah, there's no uh, specific rule that's being uh, requested this evening. Uh, really what I was hoping to accomplish tonight was just to, uh, back in October 2011, uh, administration had put forth a reorganization plan um, with the departure of Mrs. Zotos. We had put together a concept that was um, worked out primarily. I was the author of it to get it started, and then I worked with the table committee to vet through and under the concept plan was to replace one person, one full-time person, with three part-time people, uh, one being a station manager, production director, and the second being a production coordinator slash editor, and the third being the secretary slash office manager. And I just wanted to, uh, this evening, do two things. One was introduce Brian Alves, who after our search process um, came about to be the, in my opinion, and I think shared by the members of the committee that, that worked with me uh, to be the best candidate to move the town forward in terms of the station manager. Um, and perhaps if the committee would like, uh, Mr. Alves maybe can do a two or three minutes summary of kind of his uh, skills and ability and what he brings to the table. I think he'll, he could speak much more eloquently than I can with that experience. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. I, um, I'm very happy to serve Southbridge. I'm very happy to hop on board as station manager here. I have 10 to 15 years of experience as an executive director for other stations, and I'm glad to bring uh, what I know here to the town and to increase the programming and increase volunteerism and uh, just make the station a brand for the town and to make it look really good, basically. <laughs> um, I, before this, I came from University of Massachusetts Medical School. I worked as a senior manager, and uh, all those skills in my background that I will uh, bring here to Southbridge. In, in terms of uh, just, uh, Mr. L has actually started uh, this past Monday, um, 
we have two other people that are in the office that we have recruited and previously recruited the uh, person that holds the title of the uh, selection coordinator slash editor is Mike Montigny. Uh, Mike Montigny is a, a, a local, I'm going to call him a kid, a, a local uh, resident. Uh, he seems much younger than me. But uh, Michael is, uh, has had some interest in helping out with production and some of the local programming. He also is a, uh, an employee of the school department. And one of the things that I wanted to try to improve upon was to have a better relationship with the schools, a more constructive relationship with the schools. And I thought having a, uh, an employee that would, um, I didn't realize that I was getting an applicant that would be an employee of the schools, so I think that that works out. Uh, one of the things too, the 19 hours is going to be flexible, so we anticipate that Mike uh, will be doing a lot of afternoon work and a lot of evening work because he is primarily going to cover the meetings. Yeah. And then Stacey Bernard, who is known to members of the council, she's the uh, reporting clerk for the council. Uh, she applied yes. for the, um, the office uh, manager slash secretary position, and she started probably about two or three weeks ago at this point. And I would encourage uh, folks to, to stop in and see the office now. It, it is a much more welcoming environment, a much more professional environment. And I'm just kind of happy to report that you know, here was the plan and the vision, and now we have people in place to implement that. And I think really uh, from you know, this week on, hopefully we can start to see some uh, continuing results. Just two other quick comments. One is I do wish to thank Barry Davis for his uh, efforts. He certainly uh, filled in and, and helped out uh, during the transition. Uh, he knew when he was uh, hired as an interim that the interim stint would end when a permanent replacement was hired. Permanent replacement was hired, his stint ended. Uh, in terms of one of the things, and I've laid this out for members of the, uh, I shouldn't say laid out to talk to, the chairman about one of the goals that I was hoping to have uh, for the committee. And one was that we increased, um, uncharacteristically for me, we actually this is one of the highest rate increases that we've done in the time that I've been the manager, and that is to increase the amount of uh, costs just for the local programming portion of the cable operation. And what I asked was to see if we could get a snapshot in time and this is no, you know, one thing I want to point out, under the old system, having one person trying to do everything is not a good model. Having three part-timers that have specialty skills is, is I believe, a more constructive model to, to adopt to. But what I just passed out is uh, two pages. At the top, actually, the second one was we did a snapshot in time. And the snapshot in time is uh, April 14th, 2011 to uh, May 14th, 2011. So over that roughly 30-day period, at, at that point in time, we had 10 shows on. We had about seven hours of programming. And each, the average show length was about 44 minutes. And this, this is right off of Tightrope. Is that the, the name of the system? Off of the Tightrope system, uh, the same period for this year, uh, April 14th, 2012 to May 14th, 2012, we actually put on 38 different shows. And when I say shows, they, they, these can be as short as one or two minutes to as long as an hour plus. But we had 38 shows on and 23 hours of programming and the average show length was 36 minutes. So in, in, these, in both cases, this is just the, uh, the public channel 13 that's being shown. So one of the things that I, I thought would be a, a good tool to, to at least look to try to measure how are we doing is to look at what is the program we're getting on there. Uh, obviously origination programming, local origination programming is going to be hard because you need to find local producers to put it on. Uh, but there is a, a vast pool of uh, free programming that's out there that hopefully we can do a, a a good job of trying to capture additional to give the residents of uh, Southbridge uh, a better options when it comes to looking at the uh, local cable channels. I don't know if uh, if Bobby, if you wanted to say anything about uh, your efforts, because I just I probably should publicly say and just thank Bobby. I mean, it's been a difficult time and obviously going through transition. 
and quite a few members of the Gable Committee helped out in a very constructive way through the process, and I just appreciate their efforts keeping the station open and certainly participating in the process for recruitment of these uh, three personnel. Yeah, I, I definitely, uh, I definitely appreciate Barry's efforts. I enjoyed, I definitely enjoyed working with him. He was very knowledgeable, and um, you know, but in the end, you you have to look for chemistry within the organization. And when it came down to it, uh, Brian had the right chemistry for working it within the organization. Um, uh, when Barry left, I gave him my best, and at any time, he said, you know, use me for reference for whatever he wants to do. Um, I still in contact with him text me uh, the other day, so um, I wish him well. Um, I think Brian will be a, a very good fit with us um, with his background and experience. It, it's definitely, it's like a, almost no transition at all. I think just people just need to get neat needs in the face. And what the residents in town need to understand is that access is still the same. It still operates the same way. It's just a different person. Um, we're still out to provide for the producers in the community to do their production, to help their, you know, to help make it happen, get their shows on the air, so forth and so on. So it still operates just as usual. Um, in regards to the, uh, the playback, these are reports that we can generate any time for any time period, as long as we've had our playback system since it's been installed. It keeps track of any program that's ever been played. So these reports can be generated. And as Chris mentioned, you know, we're up to 38 shows, and this was just for, you know, April 14th. Was this a week, or was this a month? I forgot. A month. A month. A month. We did a month. I, I forgot what the, the settings are. This was just for that month, and of course, we had 38 shows during that month play. And basically, what you're looking at is the list of shows of that month, and if you see runs, that's the number of times it played, and length is, of course, the length of the program. Um, as Chris was alluding to, as we work more and more to try and get you know local residents involved and to take advantage of access to, to get trained on equipment to do productions of our own or even some of the cable community members do productions of themselves. Um, we have opportunities there's a site called pegmedia.org which Michael actually I explained to him there's some rather interesting programming on there so from uh, kids programs to zombies. Um, it, any, if any of you navigate to that site and see a program that you think might be of interest to in the town, by all means let us know. Uh, submit a form to, to sponsor the program and we'll, we'll find a spot for it. Um, or if you know of someone that has an access show outside of town or wherever, generally that's how most access settings work. And I'm sure Brian can inquire for this. A lot of people will send you hundreds and hundreds of DVDs saying put my show on the air. It's just a matter of having a sponsor to to put it on the air. So, uh, if there are any questions, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll have my hand up for a minute. Good. Ten minutes. Okay, I'll let you go first. I'm just saying I'm missing the information on the bottom of my sheet. I don't know if anybody else is. But. Oh, that don't that. It's basically the first page and the top section. This was just extra that got printed out. Oh, okay. okay. Um, but that is, if you were to look at the bottom, it would say top runs. So that will show you what show played the most during that period of time last year. And of course, Friends of Notre Dame played 112 times. Uh, Ken Davenport played 55 times in that month. That's just a breakdown of how many times a show played, but okay. so not the total number of programs. Yeah, just to say too, um, I don't know if I'll ever talk with Barry again, but certainly the first time I met him at the memorial when he was doing some, some work there, he was very pleasant. And, uh, any time that uh, I had something said to me that needed to get on the air, he was, he was more than accommodating. So mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed our conversations and uh, I had nothing but the best for him. So, just, uh, so that's just my point on there. But uh, Mr. Zotos, you have uh, well, I think the snapshot was a little disingenuous. Um, we've been watching cable. We live in South Bridger. We watch cable every day, 24 hours a day. And we've seen the Dick Whitney shows. They must have played 100 times over and over again. Uh, I think on Easter, we had the Bartlett football game was on Easter. And I believe on Mother's Day, they showed the Bartlett football game again. Whitney's been playing 24 hours a day, nonstop. Basketball played during football season. Football played during basketball season. 
you took a snapshot because there's been nothing on. In these last couple of weeks, especially since Thursday, somebody went in and stacked, stacked the programming and now we've got about eight hours and it's really nice. That must be Brian's work. But up until now, there's been nothing on. And we've submitted new movies and they were either played in the morning or late at night or whenever somebody wanted that to put them on. And prime time was always taken by things out of town. Right now there's five golfing shows on in a row that I pl programmed a year ago and now they're still playing in a row and it's a golf it's a golf course in Franklin it's possibly I don't really know but I somebody might be getting a kickback for this I don't know we've got golf courses here in, in my opinion I said but there's golf courses in town that aren't getting commercials but we've been showing this golf course pro last night he, he built a, a table out of a bread box and it was a golfing show I don't know what that meant he took an old bread box and he turned it into a table and, and, we, and he said, you can put this in your bedroom next to your bed. So I don't know what that is. But I did have some questions for the committee. And you, 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 first of all, Denise, and my first question is, what is the purpose of a cable access committee? And I'd like you to answer that for me, please. What would be Madam that? Chair, that's not really yeah, appropriate. Right. If there's specific questions I didn't want to be asked, I'm happy to sit down and meet with I'm not acting in Chris. I was asking you, Denise, what, what, is, what is the purpose of a cable committee? And you, you know, I understand you're asking. You don't know the day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, no, I, yeah, you didn't have to. I, I could. I could. Thank you, Chris. I would like an answer from Denise if I could. But my understanding from any meetings I attended, Mr. Zotos, and it was just, just that, as Mr. Clark said, to day-to-day -day operations, or uh, also to look over rules, regulations, set some parameters there, to follow the rules as set by the um, I think it's FCC. I gather. I think that's. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a. A whiz on the TV side of things. That's not my forte, Mr. Sotos. I know. And I'd be happy to do more research, but I do know that when I've met at some of the meetings and listened to some of the concerns about protocol or about uh, uh, you programming and different things, you know, I just listened in on your committee meetings. And it's, it's to, I imagine, the day to day and also to maybe help train people, maybe get the community more involved. It'd be nice. But that's really all I know, and I'm not going to profess to know more than I do because that would be misingenuous and misleading. I have more so questions. thank you for your question. Could, could you, could you tell I'll me, try, but you, you know, I may not be able to answer because I don't know everything. That's okay, Denise. It's, it's just a question. Mm -hmm. It's just okay. Could you tell me who's on the committee? Are you aware of who's on the committee right now? At this moment, I do not have a current list of who's on the committee. I don't know that either. All right, I got a couple more. Uh, are you aware that the committee, it's not just Mr. the committee. The Mr. Co Zotos, we're not going to get into an interrogation of what I do or do not know at the moment. I can ask this. I don't, I don't know that you don't know him. I'm asking if you do because I have this, a reason. This is, this I have a, I just, like you would say to a judge, I have a purpose for these questions, and when I'm done with the questions, I could, I'll explain my purpose. Could I be granted that amount of time after 12 years of service? Let me continue to answer. Okay. I don't know that I can answer. Are you, aware, ask, are you aware that the committee must have knowledge of the committee that they're on? They must have television knowledge. Just like you said, I don't really know. But the committee shouldn't be on the committee unless they have specific knowledge of how a cable access station works. I, I believe the charter says it's very specific that they must be able to show that they have the knowledge of today's technology. We can't have people that understood VHS technology deciding on computers and hard drives. Point noted. Another so question? Were you aware that this committee, does this committee have that knowledge? I'm not aware of that at this moment, Mr. Sotos. Okay. Have, has the committee ever displayed that knowledge to you that you know of? Personally, no. So no one's ever shown you that they knew what they were doing. Was this committee... Yeah, you know, Mr. Sotos, I mean, if you have order, is this, is this, is this, this is, our view yeah, of this It is, committee. because you just this, hired this somebody. A, I have a question. What? I did not hire... Mr. Sotos, you need to be quiet when I'm speaking. Thank you. Well, I, I was speaking. That. I was speaking. Mr. Mr. Sotos. I was asking a question. We, it's an update on the reorganization of the cable operations. That's right. These, are, these are update questions. These are update questions. Not. Mr. Clark is the person who hires okay. the station manager. Two more questions. Was the committee involved in the firing of Barry Davis and are there minutes to see? Uh, I, I have no knowledge of that. My understanding Do you have any way of finding out? I, I certainly I can ask that Mr. question. Mr. Davis was not fired. Mr. Davis was an interim and his interim he was, period ended. He was not officially hired into that position. He told me he was fired. I talked to him, but I talked to him that, twice. That, that is your recollection. I feels, know, this is an employee matter. Mr. He feels Sotos. fired. 
right. This yeah. is an employee matter that the town manager has Was this knowledgeable or unknowledgeable committee department. involved in the hiring of Brian? I, this is the first time I saw Mr. Alvarez in the hallway, and I was not involved. So the purpose of the, the committee... Council, the committee? The cable the committee. committee. I, had, um, answer, I, I had met with the cable committee and said that I didn't think it was tenable to have the entire committee, so they selected two representatives of the committee. <laughs> to facilitate the process of interviewing and selecting the <coughs> candidates. I would have input and expertise. Mr. Quintero and uh, Ray Gawkey are the two representatives of the committee. Okay. I, I, you know what? If you have specific questions on the hiring, <coughs> well, the I got a lot of questions, Denise. That's I got a great. Lot of well, we're going to move on because there are other people. Thank you so much. Too. You're wonderful. Councilor McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Thanks, what? point out a couple of things. First of all, the appropriate way to address a counselor is counselor, not by their first name. Um, I've known her all my life. Secondly, would be <laughs> that if a citizen asks us a question, this is a meeting, we should answer it. And that's, that's anybody who's here should answer it to the best of their ability. Um, that's my comment on that, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, first of all, congratulate Thank Brian you. Alvarez. I want to make Alves. 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 Okay. Um, just wanted to congratulate you. Thank you. I just want. I, do you live in Southbridge? Or I live in Worcester. Worcester. Okay. Worcester. Well, welcome to Southbridge. Thank you. I'm looking forward to what you bring to the table. Um, and that's really all I have. Thank you, Mr. Council McDonald. Anybody else in the committee have any questions before I go to? The I, I do have a question. <laughs> I know we were discussing previously about going to a nonprofit. Is that still on the table, or have we actually <laughs> just just no? <laughs> just no. Would you like to answer that? Wait, from my I said, the I, question about the nonprofit status. Right. Yeah. Are we still planning on? Is there any plans to do that, or are we looking at that, or is that off the table now? Well, it's never been off the table. Uh, actually, what has transpired is that there was a working group that was formed that had members of the Cable Committee, members of the interested community. Um, Scott Lazo was one, um, I'm trying to think of who else. Uh, as well as um, so members nice. of the council. Uh, Denise was on there. I'm trying to remember the different ones uh, that were on there. Scott Lazo, Steve Lazo at the time. Kathy. And I, I honestly don't remember no. the other one. In the, in the review of um, the process of what we were doing, what we did was I, we came to the conclusion that it would be best to, to reorganize and restructure the operation first. Basically make sure that we had a product that was viable and capable of producing good shows and, and running a, a good operation. Once we established that, we would then go, once we had the confidence and the credibility that, that they would be able to stand on their own and operate on their own, we would then pursue the issue of profit, you know, keeping it as part of government or having it be a nonprofit. In all honesty, I've been in towns in which it's been done both ways. I was actually in a town where we transitioned from having it be part of the government to having it be actually part of the cable cable company to having it be a nonprofit. So I, quite honestly, it, it, it really doesn't matter to me personally what direction we go. What does matter to me, and what I think should matter to this community in a very substantial way, is that I think we have to make sure that we have a good operation. And under the franchise agreement, there are requirements that have to be met. And we need to make sure that whatever we create are, is going to be able to fulfill those requirements. That was bad you got the idea. So what I had envisioned was that now that we have as of yesterday, all the pieces in place. We will let it run for probably three to six months, assuming, as I would assume, that things go very well. We've now created and established a very professional environment. I would encourage folks to go up there and, and don't just listen to what I say, but go up there and see for yourself. I think if we go for six months, three months, and we're in a good place, and Mr. Alvis does a, a good job for us, and we start to build, and I would like to take that next step and start to look at the concept of going on public. There is an assumption, and this is a poor assumption, but there is an assumption out there because it's never been backed up by professional information and professional information that I looked at a nonprofit out in Palmer. 
that there is going to be sufficient funds for this this current operation to go to the private sector, secure their own building, basically go out from underneath the umbrella of the subsidies that the town itself provides to this operation and be able to survive on its own. So I think that it has to be, as a first step, there has to be basically a business plan. And, and I've been trumpeting this for at least a year and a half. Somebody has to come up with a business plan. Does it make sense? Is it viable? And once we determine, and not just me, but I think really the council, because this would be a council call as well, once it's determined that, yes, it is a business viable, and that the core elements of the franchise agreement can be adhered to, then certainly it can go out and, and be more profit. In some ways, it would make, administratively, it would make my life a whole lot easier because now we no longer fall into the jurisdiction of the manager in terms of day-to-day -day assistance in the, in the operation of it. So, you know, for me, I mean, you want to say that for the manager, but the manager, even if it's not profit or if it stays a part of government, the administration of that franchise agreement is it is always the responsibility of the manager. As the law is constructed now, obviously the law can change. But as the law is constructed now, it's the obligation of the manager. So any obligation, I need to make sure I take I would agree with you on that. I think that if they're going to go out on their own, they have to be self-sufficient. I don't want to look into the town for a bailout afterwards. Uh, but the second question is that, that, that also have is, <clears throat> are we going to be putting a studio together for the community? I mean, we really haven't had a studio. Is that, is that in the plans? Well, I think to answer that, you know, it, it's, it's probably one of the most exciting times to be, honestly, at, at, in the cable business for us. Because we have a brand new middle high school coming online that I have to give tremendous uh, skill and ability to the, the folks at the engineering firm and the architect. Because what the MSBA, the Mass School Building Assistance, allowed was a media classroom. They actually designed out a media classroom that, for all intents and purposes, is a studio. So we now will have a state of the art cable studio in the middle high school. And one of the things that I saw on, on my tours of different schools way back when, when we started, which I think we should really strive for, is Southbridge kids should be doing Southbridge news, not just to the school, but town-wide. And everything has been put into place to allow that to happen. So we will have a state-of-the-art studio and when I say state of the art, I mean, granted, you're getting from a lay person, so I may not understand all the different technical performance. But we have that going into the high school. The high school will be coming online in now 60 days. I mean, we are getting close to have that online. And as for upstairs, um, certainly we have capital money that was approved as part of the negotiated contract with the, with the folks at Charter. That capital money has not been utilized extensively yet. And if there is occasion to either improve the studio upstairs or relocate the studio upstairs to another location, that's something that, the, that I think the cable committee and I need to work on, what makes the most sense. So right now, we're looking at the opportunity to upgrade the studio we have upstairs, uh, most likely in the, in the fall, and a new studio coming online at the New York High School. So in that middle high school studio, at this point, is at no cost to the, uh, <coughs> to the cable funds that have been appropriated for the capital purposes. Now, I talked to Scott Mazzo, and he has told me that they're talking about the possibility of us having a studio at the Southbridge High. What you're talking about is it's, there's PEG, P -E -G, Public Education and Government. Right. That the, the, middle, uh, the middle high school there, that, that sounds like it's going to take care of the education segment of it. I understand that we're going to be putting robotics up uh, in the upstairs. That, that can help with the government. <coughs> the public is what is lacking, and mm -hmm. that would be able to solve that problem. I hope that that is looked at carefully. And that was actually just brought to my attention this afternoon in the location, and that's something that I think once we get settled, you know, obviously we're we just now this week got things in place. We'll probably give them 30 days before we, you know, start sprinting. 
but we'll definitely look at that high school and see what's the viability. There is a drop already, so the, the charter folks have a live drop, a live, a live feed, I think is what it's called. They have a live feed already to that school. So the, the feasibility of that is, is very real. But that is a discussion, a larger discussion for the council and the school committee to talk about reuses of buildings and where pieces go. So that's not just a small discussion. Um, I'm going to let Mr. Satilli go because he's had his hand up for so long and I'll let Council McDonald go. I have, three, I have three questions. Number one, I submitted a uh, technical issue to the town manager who uh, then allegedly transmitted it to the cable committee and over a month ago and I never received uh, an answer from the cable committee. Um, to give yourself some background on myself, my trade is an electronic engineer and uh, I at one time held a first class FCC license. So uh, for the committee not to answer my query uh, is an abridgment of their responsibility. It's been over a, a, almost two months. So I'd like to know why and when that happened. Okay, we'll let Mr. Kinteria answer. Mr. Satilli, I did get your email. Um, I brought it up at our last cable committee meeting and we came up with an answer for you. Um, but we previously spoke on the phone and I, uh, on our discussion on the phone, I kind of gave you what we could and could not do. What the cable committee asked of me is that I forward it to everyone on the cable committee for approval before I send it off to you. I have not heard back from them yet. I, I assure you I'm going to get back to them. Okay. And, um, um, but as I said, we did speak on the phone. Our email is just basically a hard copy of what I said on the phone uh, to you in regards to your requests. Um, I can address to you one of your concerns about downloading forms for producers, we definitely are going to be putting that in place. You can download the forms. It's PDF would be good. Yeah, a PDF yeah. file. What we need to do is we need to update our forms and policies, and we have not finished that yet. And as soon as we do, but feel free, in short, now to take any of our forms you need and photocopy them at your Done at your will, and you can just submit them as that way. But eventually, they will be available online. In short, um, as far as submitting programs along with an email, it's not possible because you need, there's so much data space that emails can't handle, you can't do it. Um, in the email that I will be sending out to you, it'll have a list of uh, formats that our system will take that are digital. Um, but for now, if you do have a, a, form, uh, a program that you want to submit, a DVD is fine. Just, to, just as normal, you can do that. But as far as uh, electronically digital files, it's still status quo. It's a, either you could bring it in as a data on disk or a DVD itself. Um, but to email a file, it just it can't happen. Your email won't accept it. The file yeah, I know, I know the bandwidth. Um, the next question is Mr. Alvarez. Is it Alvarez? Alves. Alves. I'm sorry. Alves. Alves. Um, your experience uh, with uh, as a cable station manager. Mm -hmm. uh, what was uh, and you didn't get on to the different locations, but what was your relationship to the uh, public producers? And how did you handle uh, outreach to them? Well, public, public producers to me are a very valuable asset to any cable access organization. Um, they're the heart and soul of, of, of the station itself. Um, what I normally did was I started in a uh, startup of many access stations throughout Massachusetts, Marion, Rochester, Mattapoisett, Randolph, just to name a few, Salem, um, just to name a few. And what we basically did was a lot of outreach, a lot of um, basically using the channel for outreach and word of mouth. Um, one strategy that always worked was putting programming on the air. And I just noticed this sheet here, which is very helpful in knowing you know, where the programming is going. And, and once people see that other people are producing programming, Word travels fast, especially if it's done easy. If you have uh, classes and courses that are made available that are easy to do, um, just word travels very fast. Uh, I was on board most of the stations that I started. Um, I was on board for less than three months and I had close to 500 members sign on. So, and I intend to 
hopefully get somewhere here with that. I mean, being on a part-time basis, uh, you know, there isn't that high of an expectation, but um, that's some, some of the things that I've done. So I'm very enthusiastic about what, what can be done here, and I think the stage is set in, to make it happen. Well, welcome. Thank you. The last thing I have to say is um, I saw Mr. or Barry, one of that, I don't know his name. Davis. 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 I saw him publish on the, uh, on the internet that he was fired uh, and because he questioned uh, the <coughs> diversion of uh, cable funds uh, from uh, uh, the uh, folks at Charter. Uh, and it's, he published that on the internet and I was wondering whether or not that there, uh, is it fact or was it uh, some other Yeah, the, the fact that someone puts something on the internet certainly does not make it make it fact. Or the fact that someone puts it on a blog does not make it fact. Uh, obviously, the issue of indirect costs has been brought up ad nauseum for years I've been here. Um, and I think that he was fairly new to the community, didn't fully understand the concept of indirect cost. Once again, it's the umpteenth time. We have indirect costs because the cable operations by itself cannot sustain itself. So therefore, there are town functions that are paid for by the taxpayer to supplement the operation of the cable. And in that, the Mass General Law allows, and we are audited by the Department of Revenue, and we are audited by our independent auditor to make sure that those indirect costs are reasonable. So we do have an indirect cost analysis that's done and that justifies those costs. I think two years ago it was $37,000. We charged the cable committee 30. I think this year we have that review and because the re renewal of the license has been concluded, the amount of hours that have gone in there, um, as well as the reorganization, if we need concluded here, that the number of hours going forward is going to drop significantly. I believe that number was close to 25,000. So that is dropping as the committee is able to do more on its own independently. So, you know, accusations are made, and that's exactly what they are accusations, and there is no basis in fact as from what I just Thank, Thank you very much, Council. Thank you. Council Donalds. Thank you, Matt Chair. I just had a couple of questions I threw you to the town manager. And it is relative to indirect costs. Well, I also want to point out before that, um, licensing authority versus content censoring, I think, is what some concerns that people have expressed to me. So, you know, FCC licenses stations, but they don't censor content. Mm -hmm. like this, the same yeah, yeah, it's the same expectation we would have in the government <coughs> here. Uh, but in, in, to the point of indirect costs, because we, we said that we're subsidizing cable. Mm -hmm. and subsidizing has a very specific meaning. Uh, so my first question would be, how much how much do we get from charter to four? 109,000. So 109,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and out of that, how much do we charge? You just, I guess it's 25,000. The indirect costs are 25,000 a year, year yeah. coming up on this yeah. next fiscal year. Obviously, if we did a true analysis for the amount of time, you know, every hour that my time is taken away from the taxpayer's work to do cable work could be theoretically an indirect cost assessed to the, the cable operation. Uh, but, you know, obviously we try to estimate what that is and the amount of time that I have invested on behalf of the taxpayers to, for the reorganization and for the licensing renewal and the recruitment of the three individuals has been uh, a lot. Well, that would lead me to the next thing. Which would, you know, what would be the formula? Nonprofits, whenever you're determining g &A, that's basically what indirect costs are. General administration is a specific formula, usually set by the federal government, that has to be reported on the IRS Form 990. And to me, it seems like the standard of, that we would use would be that same standard. Um, in, in, in terms of, uh, of the time of the manager, I, if we hire a station manager, I wouldn't expect the manager to be handling anything in day-to-day -day operations. And that's one of the reasons why the numbers <coughs> gone down. Right. Okay. But so I would ask then, what would be, what is the formula that we use to calculate GNA? To come up with that. GNA, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that terminology. That's the term general administration for the overhead. And I, I understand where you're going. 
but there's an indirect cost analysis that we're entitled to do that falls under Massachusetts General Law 4453E and a half that allows for a enterprise operation to be conducted and we are allowed to assess what the taxpayers, what taxpayer resources are used for enterprise operations, we are allowed to recoup that from the enterprise in which we subsidize. So subsidy is we have a term of art, I mean, it, I think it's an adequate term for what, we're, for what we're accomplishing. I point to the going out on your own. There is no rental, there is no lease payment that the cable folks have. They fall within our insurance. They fall underneath the insurance umbrella of the town. Some of that is apportioned off. If you become an independent nonprofit, all of that becomes now the obligation of that of that company. So to your point about the, the GNA, the, the general administration of, of an organization, it does fall onto that company. And when you look at the Palmer model and just take their budget and extrapolate it out, it doesn't appear to me, and I, I've done numbers for a long time, it doesn't appear to me that there's adequate money for these folks to go out on their own and to, to run a full-scale cable. That doesn't mean it's not you know, possible. It just means that based upon at least one model that I looked at, one business plan that I looked at, it doesn't appear on the surface. That doesn't mean that opportunities aren't there to, to do that. And just, just to follow up to that, because I mean I understand enterprise operations in terms of water and sewer, etc. But the whole point of this is it's <coughs> you have to cable access. I don't see how cable, we're not advertising, we're not getting paying. This is no other than the rate payers and it's a community service. I mean, that's the whole reason. We wouldn't see a water and sewer company go to non-profit, but cable access can because it's not really an enterprise. And so, um, I yeah, wonder if those... We actually bought a, bought a private water company to get into the water business. I understand that. But to it, and actually it's called an offset receipt account. So it's, it's in that same section of law that I referenced. But the purpose is, and this is where you'll draw the connection, is that it is a fee-based instead of a tax-based system. And certainly cable is a fee-based system. And I would just make one last comment. It's not a fee of the government. It's a fee. When the water system, whatever, that I don't think I'm going to Okay, thank you. That, that answers my question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, you're welcome. Um, I think it was Mr. Sotison and uh, Mr. Pelton. Mine is, uh, I, I hope and I pray that we try to keep the public studio in the downtown district. I mean, the, the think of the public studio, I mean, there, there's going to be lots of times when the, the high school, the new high school, because of the location, either we're using the auditorium, the gym, the field, all those beautiful rooms they got up there. So we would do a partnership, but for the public to get all the way up there where that is, and, and maybe it's an event at night, it would be hard for them to get up there and during the day. And as, the, as these guys know, we work late at night. It would be too far out to think that the public would have access to it. So that's why we we would only do like a partnership up there. That's what we were working on. And um, I'll finish with that. I uh, I really believe that there is no such thing. There is there has never been and there never will be a such thing as a government controlled public television station. It's no such thing. Even in Venezuela, that's a dictator. Al Jazeera is a dictator. Newt Gingrich didn't want to fund public TV, but he never wanted to run it. And he never talked about content. He wanted public TV to go public, and it did. And we should try to keep government out of the public segment of the TV at all times. That's why we're having a hard time working in this building, and that's why we have a hard time finding a place and finding volunteers, because a lot of people didn't want to be here. And I suffered just like these guys are going to suffer, trying to get people to do that and try to keep them involved. It was the, the, the most difficult part of the job was to keep the crews for all the meetings and all the joint meetings and all the special meetings and all the meetings of the whole and in the school. And that's very difficult to do that just with volunteerism. But we did because we did these people favors and we made movies with them and we did a lot of special things. And a lot of times we worked outside the box. But 
let's try to keep at least the public TV public. Whether it goes non-profit, it's always going to be under the town, even the non-profit. And we always wanted everybody to be on the board of directors, so nobody was running off somewhere doing something private. We didn't want to be a burden, and we just wanted independence. And that's all anybody wants. And you know, and, and everybody in Massachusetts knows that Southwich had a great television station before, and everybody knows that Southwich is going to have a great television station forever <coughs> because we love it. Just like we love our paper, we love that radio, we love our downtown. And um, I, uh, I will always do what I can to try to help the station. And uh, we've got a lot of history filmed up there. I've got 12 years filmed, and I hope it's been preserved. I hope that everything's okay. I have no idea. I trust everybody up there. I didn't, I didn't give anybody a hard time for six months because I love that stuff up there. I found movies, and I hope somebody finds my movie someday. And we got a birthday coming up in 2016, and we got to put all that stuff together and show how great we are. Bye, everybody. It was nice talking to you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you, too. I'm sorry, Councilor. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, actually, just a couple of things to Councilor Donald, if I could uh, mention a couple of things. Being on that committee, which was short, but it was still there, but sort of not lingering, some of the questions that I had specifically, just to some of your points, was, you know, and, and to the town manager's comments about business, <coughs> numerous times commented about even just a one page business plan, something to come up with, how can you fund the non <coughs> beyond, beyond the 109000 that we were getting at the time. Um, constantly had conversation with Mr. Gaddy about that type of thing. Um, conversations about keeping it in town. Conversations about uh, did you have you looked around at any of the empty storefronts, potential rent interest? Uh, have you done any research on how much it might cost for a location? Um, and, and some of our conversations even went as far as you know additional funding, fundraisers were, were commented by Mr. Gaddy and, and others, and saying, oh well, you know we have to do things to raise money to, to keep open a nonprofit. So. There were a lot of hurdles, not to say that they're unsurmountable, but certainly they were addressed and talked about quite at length in my, many conversations that I know I've had. I don't know about the rest of the group, and, and visits to the stations and different things. So, like Mr. Clark says, I, I believe that it's not necessarily off the table. I just don't know that it's, it's a workable plan at the very moment to get it there, but I certainly think that uh, it's not impossible to make happen. Um, the economy the way it is, you know, but that's just my, this is just, information from my, my point of being participant in that group. So I'm just passing that along to you. Ms. Pelican, you have your hand up? Yes, I was just curious. Um, previous discussions of the cable reorganization happened in general government subcommittees, so I was wondering why this had been moved over to the EHS subcommittee. Well, actually... The governmental the, reorganization is one that falls under the purview Mr. of general Lord, government. I'd actually like to answer that Sorry. first, if that's okay. Thank you. First off, my <laughs> agenda... I, my agenda item was to have a presentation by Mr. Davis, as we discussed a number of weeks ago, and as I announced on Monday night. <coughs> Again, my intention was to, when I saw this agenda on Friday morning, my information, obviously Thursday night things have changed, and I, somebody, well, Barry came out to the hallway and, and talked to us briefly, so at that moment I wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen, but I saw this agenda on, on Friday morning, and the, to see it just was updating reorganization, I assume that Mr. Clark took it upon himself to perhaps rewrite my agenda item, which was a presentation by Mr. Davis, on the reorganization of what he was doing here at Cable. And I was more than open to, to see what was going on up there at the Cable Station. On that note, when I read this, I did call the office and I did readdress this to say, well, obviously that I assumed and, and I was pretty much um, acknowledged that that was the, you know, they changed it up a bit and then there were a few other things. So in terms of it being under here, Cable Operations fall under, uh, for purposes of budget, they fall under General Zoman, for purposes of subcommittee, they call under DHS. Didn't make that rule, it just is, but Mr. Well, Clark, now just, you can. Just, yeah, <laughs> I apologize for helping you. It's been a long couple of in, in terms of when you do a reorganization, or and, and I don't make up the rules, these are the rules that I've understood since I've been here, that general government is a catch-all, and that any time you do a structural change to government, or you want to amend a bylaw, that it goes to general government. So the reorganization, to, to my interpretation of how it works, went to general government. But any operational issues related to that department is certainly that department falls within EHS, and that's why this is here, because it's specifically to EHS. Thank you. So, okay. Anybody else at this point? Mr. Cantera. Really quick. <laughs> um, just to add to about nonprofit status, 
when Barry was, was with us, me and him actually sat down and went over some numbers to calculate a budget. And it is true, it, it, the budget would be slimmed down. And mind you, this was, I believe we said, one full-time person with no benefits. And after going through all the possibilities of rent, utilities, and everything, we were looking at a leftover of maybe $9,000. That will just not get you through. Now, mind you, if, if the station continues to be you know, fruitful, which I'm sure, <coughs> if people start coming back to charter, which would be nice, the funds go up. But the thing is, I think we have charter to blame for that, not access. They don't. If they're not going to be competitive with the dish in town, we're not going to see increases. We're going to see decreases, and it's going to hurt us in the end. Access will suffer even more. Um, a lot of access centers are suffering now because of just lack of funds. And that's something we have to look out for in the future, too. Hence, fundraisers, when you become a nonprofit, there's a lot of other organizations that do fundraisers and go out and make commercials. Because once you're a nonprofit organization, you can actually do that. Advertisements for businesses and now a short, small fee. So these are all the things that need to be looked at in the future. When the business model is actually presented. You know, does it really work? And you know, projections of what happens if funds get lost and what do you think? Just things to look out for. Thank you. I appreciate that. I should know that you guys have done this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we've um, gone over this agenda item quite thoroughly, and we'll just jump along now. Are you all set? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Or just Thank you. Thank Does the email stay the same? The uh, to send in a submission to something. Software yeah. cable. Software cable. You can still send it to that. Um, Mr. Alves will get a copy of that. It always goes through. Okay. It goes through. Yes. Great. But he I know will that be. I sometimes get people sending out things that then I forward on. He will be set up with his own email. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Okay. We're gonna. Um, you need to print out the one that they were sent back to. Here, just a problem. All right, uh, agenda item number three, trash, trash enforcement efforts update. And again, this I would have expected was combined with the recycling process. And we're just sort of reviewing to see. Um, we talked a little bit at the town meeting on Monday about this. Um, some of the things that have been done in the last couple of weeks. Would you, Mr. Clark, would you like to make any comments? On this I mean, I'm happy to do.